module 11 again, this time pages 362 through 367, right up until when the book starts to talk about molality. So we are talking about pressure this time and what pressure does to the solubilities of gases, liquids, and solids. And as you will see, increasing pressure increases the solubility of gases. Take for example, the carbonation, the gases that are dissolved in this Diet Coke. The gases have to be brought closer together in order to make them um, in, it's in a liquid form, okay? So that they're dissolved into the liquid of the Diet Coke. Whereas they really wanna be gases and they wanna be farther apart from each other, right? So under the pressure of this Diet Coke can, the carbonated gases are more soluble. But when I decrease the pressure by opening the Diet Coke can, decrease the pressure, oh, I can see a little mist coming out and the gases are saying, yay, we're free, we're free. There's not so much pressure in this can anymore. We can be let out and not dissolved. Okay, so increased pressure increases the solubility of gases. When you decrease the pressure, the solubility decreases and the gases are like, we're out of here. All right, so that's pressure with gases. Pretty easy with liquids and solids. Pressure does not affect liquids and solids. So if you are dissolving a liquid into a liquid or a solid into a liquid, even if you condense the container and increase the pressure, it's not gonna affect the solubility of the liquid or the solid. All right, moving on. The next section in your book is called Energy Changes. Energy changes, the book says, that occur when making a solution. Energy changes that occur when making a solution. I'm just gonna write energy changes because I can. Uh, you have probably heard these terms before, exothermic and endothermic. So sometimes when making a solution, remember when we're making a solution, we're dissolving a solute in a solvent to make a solution. Sometimes that can either absorb energy in making that solution, or it can give off energy in the form of heat. So exothermic is when a process lets out or gives off heat. When a process is exothermic, or if making a solution is exothermic, it will give off heat and the surroundings, or like the beaker that you're making the solution in will actually get hot. That would be exothermic. The surroundings get hot. So if the solution is in a beaker, the beaker gets hot. The opposite, sometimes when you have a chemical reaction, it absorbs heat. That is an endothermic process. Endothermic is a process that absorbs heat. And if it's absorbing heat, then the surroundings get cooler because the reaction is actually taking heat out of the surroundings, so the surroundings lose heat, which means they get cooler. So if you have an endothermic process when you're making a solution, your beaker and your solution itself would actually feel cooler to the touch. Uh, read more about that in your book, but that's basically, you just need to know those definitions and understand what that means. So lastly, we are going to, wow, we are just flying through this video, aren't we? The next section is called applying stoichiometry to solutions. And we are gonna look at example 11.1 .1 in your book. 11.1 says, pause one moment while I grab my book. <clears throat> okay, the example says a chemist wishes to make calcium carbonate the principal component in Tums and acid, as well as in chalk. Hmm, weird. By using the following reaction, da 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 If the chemist mixes 50 milliliters of 1.23 molar sodium carbonate, okay, so we have the concentration of the sodium carbonate 
and we have how much we're using. With an excess of calcium hydroxide, how many grams of calcium carbonate will be produced? So what we are looking for in this problem is how many grams of calcium carbonate. And the way we're gonna get there, let me kind of give you an overview or a little map of what we're gonna to use to get there. Okay, we are given molarity and number of liters for Na2CO3. So using the molarity or the concentration of the sodium carbonate and how much of it, we're going to figure out how many moles of Na2CO3 we have. And then using the balanced equation, we can see how many moles of sodium or of, yeah, of sodium carbonate will produce how many moles of calcium carbonate. We can use that ratio to figure out moles of calcium carbonate. And then from moles of calcium carbonate, of course, we can use our beloved table, which we have not referred to in way too long, in my opinion. But we can finally refer to it again today to figure out how many grams are in one mole of calcium, calcium carbonate and then we will figure out how many grams of calcium carbonate are produced. So that's kind of our overall map and all the different steps that we get to do together for this problem. All right, so in figuring out how many moles of sodium carbonate, we know that molarity equals moles per liter. So I'm gonna work my algebra magic and see that moles then would equal molarity times liters. So for moles of sodium carbonate, we just need to multiply its molarity times its number of liters. The problem tells us that the molarity is 1.23 molarity, but in parentheses, 1.23 molar sodium carbonate. We're gonna multiply it by how many liters we have. We have 50 milliliters. So I can do this in my head, 50 milliliters. I move the decimal place to the left three times. So I get 0 0.05000 liters of sodium carbonate. Multiply these together and the answer is 0 0.0615 moles of Na2 CO3. All right, so we've completed our first step. We used our molarity and number of liters to go to figure out moles of sodium chloride. Now we're going to figure out how many moles of calcium carbonate we have. So we start with moles of uh, sodium carbonate, 0 0.0615 moles of sodium carbonate. And we look to the balanced equation, which is given to us in the example. So how many moles of sodium carbonate are in the example? Well, we look at that big uh, coefficient out front of Na2CO3, which is an invisible one. So for every one mole of sodium carbonate, now look to the products, how many moles of calcium carbonate can be produced? Look to that coefficient out front of the CaCO3, again, and it's invisible one. So we have a one-to-one -one ratio. So we'll write that out. So for every one mole of Na2CO3 that is reacted, we will produce one mole of calcium carbonate. So, Zero or yeah, 0 0.0615 moles times one divided by one equals 0 0.0615 moles. And now our units are moles of calcium carbonate. So nice work, we got to the next step. We only have one step to go. Now we're going to move from moles of calcium carbonate to grams of calcium carbonate. So zero, 0 0.0615 moles of calcium carbonate. We're gonna multiply it by the ratio 
of how many moles to grams there are. So for every one mole of CaCO3, we need to know how many grams there are of CaCO3. Now this is going back a few weeks, if not months. But remember, on the periodic table, it tells us how many grams are in one mole of each of these elements. Okay, so for calcium, we have to add up each of the atoms that are present here. Okay, so we've got calcium is 40.1, put that into your calculator, plus we have one carbon, which is 12.0, so plus 12.0, plus we have three oxygens. Oxygens are 16.0, so plus 16.0, plus 16.0, plus 16.0, three of those. And if we add all of those together, we will see that for every one mole of calcium carbonate, there are 100.1 grams of calcium carbonate. Then our moles can cancel out so that we can multiply across here and end up with 6.16 grams of calcium carbonate are produced. Okay, so that's how we use solutions, or that's how we use stoichiometry uh, with solutions. We use the molarity of a solution, how concentrated it is, and how much we're using of it to figure out how many moles of it we're using. And then we can manipulate and do our different calculations to find out how many reactants and products are produced and how many moles or grams are produced. All right already the end of our video. I hope you understand. Make sure you read this stuff in your book as well for more necessary information and I will see you next time.